As we continue in our worship service, we come to our sermon this morning, and we've been in this series called Grow, where we've been talking about what is it that would help us as Christians to grow to our full potential, to grow to be what God wants us to be. And we've talked about the fact that with COVID, some of the structures that have helped us grow aren't there anymore in the church. It, it's uh, a little harder, perhaps, to have those outside things in our life that are helping us grow. And this morning, we're thinking about, well, how do you have resilience in the face of that? And resilience is a word that we've bandied about a lot, probably, during this COVID time. You know, the words pivot and resilience, and a few of these have become favorite words of many people. But resilience is really simple. In science, resilience is anything that has the ability to return to its original shape after being bent, stretched, compressed. Um, think of rubber ball, a rubber band, uh, a spring. These things are resilient in the sense that when, when force is applied to them, they will come back to their original and in people, we've kind of applied that, and we've said, well, people are resilient if they have the ability to spring back after encountering difficulty, if they've had the ability to weather adversity, if, and maybe just more than just spring back, but, but to actually grow from adverse events and act, actually find meaning in them. And we've needed that in this time. And so we've been talking over the past few weeks about how do we be so deeply rooted in our faith that we can grow and thrive even in this time. And we've talked about all kinds of images. We've talked about sweet peas and apple trees and fig trees and grain and tap roots and soil. And yet in the back of my mind, there's really been one image that has kind of stayed with me, and it's this image of the apple tree and our lives as an apple tree. And maybe it's because the Okanagan's so close, maybe it's because I've seen apple trees growing in orchards, or maybe it's that apple trees are just really simple. The only thing apple trees need to do is to bear apples. Now, they can look pretty in the spring when the flowers are out, and they can do all kinds of other stuff, but really, their one purpose in life is just to have apples on them that can be harvested. It's to bear fruit. And I just think that's probably a pretty good image of the Christian life. This idea that we're to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ who are maturing and reproducing ourselves and bearing fruit. And we said that if you're going to do that, what you need to do if you're a tree or a person is you've got to put down some deep roots we called them tap roots. And last week I suggested you could have two or maybe three. Uh, this week we're going to nuance that a little bit. But we said last week that you need a spiritual root. You need prayer and Bible reading and time with God. You need worship. You need um, generosity. You need community. You need these things that are the, the tap root of our life. And then we said there was another root that's there, which is this uh, outward one, which is uh, involvement in mission of some kind in the world, uh, involvement in our vocation and our avocation, our work and our hobbies, if you want, that we're intentional about how we spend our time and our lives. And what kind of encourages me is that Jesus always felt free to just use a ton of different images and when he was talking about the kingdom of God, he would say things like, well, the kingdom of God is like yeast, or the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, or the kingdom of God is like a treasure in a field. And each one of those tells you something different about what the kingdom of God is like, but you don't put them together. So maybe for the images of this uh, series, well, we just need to take a look at how different images show this in different ways. And so today I want to suggest that our Christian life could be thought of like a tree, and specifically like an apple tree. There's the tap root that goes down. That's that spiritual connection to God. The deeper and the, and the stronger that is, the more that tree will thrive. And then there's the 
mission and the vocation and the avocation, the difference we make in our work and our hobbies and the world. And that's like the fruit on the tree. And so you got the fruit and you got the root, and then connecting those is the trunk and the branches. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. What is it that we need in order for that fruit to bear if we're deeply rooted? What, what would be the equivalent of the trunk and the branches in our lives? And that's what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to suggest to you this morning that it's the physical component of our life. And maybe you're going to push back on me a little bit, and you're going to say, Dale, I'm not sure the physical is all that important. Um, our relationship to God is spiritual. And I'm not sure that anything you're going to say about the physical is really that important. And that's where the Bible is unique. It's where the Old Testament and the New Testament talk about a very physical reality to our lives. See, if you're a Buddhist, um, there is no reality in the physical. You know, you're a spiritual being having a temporary physical experience. But in Christianity, the Bible just values physical. It, it, I mean, open the Bible to the first book. It's the book of Genesis. And what does the book of Genesis start with? It starts with the physical creation of the world. How God created everything that is, all matter. And then what happens? We get into the creation of people. And people are created physically. Um, it says Adam was created out of the dust of the earth. Eve is created out of the rib of Adam. And that's picture language, but it's anchoring it in the physical. Take a look at Jesus. When Jesus comes, he doesn't come as this spiritual being. He comes as a physical baby. He comes not as a disembodied spirit, but he comes as this baby who grows up, who goes through all the aspects of life as we know it. As Luke says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. And he feels stress and he feels tiredness and he feels hunger. And when he's resurrected, even then it's still a physical body. Even then is this promise that, that the physical is not done away with even in the resurrection. It's changed, no doubt about that. But there's still something physical about us. And I think that story of doubting Thomas is there because it's anchoring this physical very much in the resurrection. John puts it this way. A week later, that's after Easter, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. So there is some differences in this physical body. But he said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Jesus was again anchoring all this in the physical. In fact, when Paul talks about uh, sexuality and the importance of uh, being pure and holy in that area of sexuality, it's because it affects our body. He says, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, whom you have received from God? And he talks about the physical as being as important as the spiritual in some ways. He said, I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself would be disqualified. In other words, the physical is crucial to who we are. And if we're going to be deeply rooted spiritually and we're going to bear fruit that makes a difference in the world, it's going to come through our physical bodies in some way. Maybe you remember that story of Elijah. Elijah was a prophet in the Old Testament, uh, you know, maybe 900 years before Jesus. And Elijah um, had this encounter with the prophets of Baal, who was the other god that a lot of people in Israel were worshiping. And on Mount Carmel, they had this uh, contest about having a sacrifice, and you can read about that. But at the end of it, his life is threatened, and he runs away. And here comes this passage, as he's been running for a couple of days. 
Elijah came to a broom bush and sat down and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God, which we also know as Mount Sinai. What's interesting is when Elijah went through this spiritual depression, what God did was feed him, give him something to drink, and kind of force him to sleep. In other words, three very physical things. And this idea of the physical is just, I think, really crucial. And I think we don't take that very much into account in our lives. And if you were to ask me, Dale, what are the things that that being physical would mean if I'm to be this fully devoted follower of Jesus? Let me suggest four. The first one is rest. We see that in that story of Elijah, and we hear about it from the medical people almost every day. Our bodies were made for a rhythm of work, rest, work, rest. Our heartbeat is just an image of that, the contraction, the rest, the contraction, the rest. Our day is an example of that. We work in the daytime. We sleep at night. Our week is the same according to God. We work six days. We rest one day on the seventh. And the Old Testament was just clear that there were these rhythms of time. Rhythms of morning and evening sacrifice. We started the day with God. We end the day with God. We go into the night. There's the Sabbath. Once a week we have this rest. There's the new moon festival. The first, uh, the months in Israel were all by the moon. So 28 days, not, not our 30, 31, 28 crazy days. But the first day of every month was a new moon festival. That was a holiday. You took a break. Three feasts a year. One of them you go down to Jerusalem, Passover. You get to be with people. It's this big party in the capital city. Uh, the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when they remembered that they'd lived in the desert for 40 years when Moses brought them out of Egypt. And you actually just kind of built a booth out of sticks and you lived in it. We call that camping today, but, uh, you know, you'd spend a week camping as a religious thing. And there was this built-in rhythm to rest in the Old Testament. And I think we've lost those. I think we've got to the place where we work too long. We have electricity so we can keep going late into the night. We have trouble slowing down at the end of the day, so we have trouble sleeping through the night. We struggle to take a Sabbath, to take a Sunday off. We struggle with weekends away or holidays on an annual basis. And I think what God calls us to do is to see holidays as not vacations. Holiday comes from holy day. It's time to... Renew and refresh with God. Vacation comes from <clears throat> vacate, you know, empty. And we just empty our lives of something. And Holy Day kind of puts something in there. And so this idea that we're going to live life in a rhythm in our time. The second one is diet and exercise. I ain't going to talk much about this because I don't do it as well as I should. But eating regularly, healthfully, in moderation weighing what we're supposed to weigh, eating healthy food choices, eating at regular times, all those things that we know we should do but maybe struggle to do. And then exercise, being physically active to the ability that we're able. Exercise that has three components. One is cardiovascular, that is it it helps our heart and our breathing Exercise that's strength building helps our muscles to grow and develop and at least to have some degree of strength, if not to be ripped like the rock. And flexibility, the ability to bend and to stretch and to be able to move. 
And exercise kind of needs those three components to it. But the, the body is important and how we look after it is important. And if you had an expensive car that required a certain kind of gas and it needed a certain kind of maintenance and it needed certain parts on it, you don't buy a $200,000 Ferrari, run it on the cheapest gas you can get, put the cheapest tires you can get on it, and drive it like crazy. You, you look after it because it is fearfully and wonderfully made, they tell me. And, of course, an image of us. The third one is uh, the one we don't talk about as Christians at all, maybe, especially as adults, and that's the idea of play. The idea of renewal through just playing. And if we got kids, our kids come out to play, yeah. But for us as adults, I just think this, this having things in life that we just do for the pure enjoyment of doing them. Two things I picked up over this COVID thing is I went back to woodworking in my garage, built a bed and some other stuff, and took up disc golf. Just love going down to Baker Park and playing disc golf with someone or even just going down by myself and I usually find somebody and we end up playing together. But one is very quiet, puttering in my garage, mostly by myself, sometimes with Don. The other social, where I make play dates to go and uh, spend time with people as I'm playing. But the question is, do we have things that we do strictly for the enjoyment of them because they bring us renewal? And that's the question. And the fourth one is one that, well, maybe it's <laughs> not as exciting. And it's prune. And uh, yeah, in health you would think prune juice. But no, I'm actually thinking of pruning, of cutting back, of getting rid of things. When you prune a rose bush, you cut off some of the branches that aren't important so that the important ones can thrive. When you have an apple tree, you go through and you prune it so that it bears fruit, so that it's got healthy branches. And the question is, is there stuff we need to prune in our lives? Is there stress that we have simply because we just have too much stuff? You know, this question of do we need 42 pairs of pants or socks or shoes or whatever your thing is, do you need all those books or all those tools or all those fabrics or all those toys? And George Carlin had a song, but let me read you part of it. It says, that's all you need in life, a little place for your stuff. That's all your house is, a place to keep your stuff. If you didn't have so much stuff, you wouldn't need a house. A house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it. And when you leave your house, you've got to lock it up. Wouldn't want someone to come by and take some of your stuff, because that's what your house is, a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. Sometimes you've got to move, got to get a bigger house. Why? No room for all your stuff. Jesus kind of put it this way on the pruning part of it. He says, I'm the true vine, my father is the gardener, and he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And I just wonder, what is it that we need to prune? Maybe it's possessions. Maybe it's getting rid of some stuff. And I know early on in the COVID thing, a lot of people did a lot of cleaning. But maybe it's commitments. Maybe we're overcommitted to this bunch of different stuff. Maybe we're overworking. Maybe it's email lists that we're on, or podcasts, or TV shows that we record, or relationships. Maybe we need to prune 200 names off our Facebook and Instagram pages, or TikTok or LinkedIn, depending what age you are. And then how do we intentionalize how we actually connect with the people who are left? You see, I think the result of that is resilience. We find a rhythm between work and rest, healthy eating and exercise, time to play and just recharge, pruning off the excess that weighs us down. And I think that's all this idea of the trunk and the branches. 
So let's kind of put it all together as we sort of come to a transition point, if not the end of this sermon. We said we need to find a way to not rely on the outward ministries of the church to prop us up in our spiritual life, but to have deep enough roots, a strong enough trunk, and the ability to bear fruit that comes not because the church is giving us all these programs and ministries, but because we've kind of internalized that and we've created a rhythm or a structure or a discipline for how to do that. And we said that we need these three aspects of life, the inner, the outer, and the physical. And we said that each of those has maybe three, maybe four different components. And that's why I've got this chart. This chart is showing you a way to actually put this all into practice. It's called a rule of life. And it's what it is. It's an intentional way of living out these four sermons that we've been talking about. I mean, if you made a plan, what if you could do it all on one page? What if you could do it in a way that would sum up the important aspects of life that would give you a plan going forward and a place to review going backwards? It would be a reminder of the important things that we've committed to. And so what if we put a list across the top, as you see on the thing, there's an inner, there's an outer, there's a physical then there's like reading and praying, and there's worship, and there's uh, community and giving, and there's uh, mission and vocation and avocation, and there's these things we talked about today with uh, rest and diet and exercise and play and prune. And what if we put all of those across the top, and then if going down we said, what do we do daily in each of these areas? What do we do weekly? What do we do monthly? What do we do quarterly? What do we do yearly? And what if we began to fill that out? What if you took a couple of hours, you and, you and your spouse if you have one, or whoever's a significant part of your life, and you said, well, what would that look like? Well, what would it look like daily to read? Well, I'll have a daily quiet time, and I'll do it at this time. What would it look like weekly? Well, maybe once a week uh, you, you do something a little different. Maybe it's a little more in-depth. Maybe on Sunday uh, you read a little bit more, or you read a book on something. What if every month you were reading through something, and every month you read through this thing? What if... Uh, in our vocation. What is it we do every day? Well, maybe it's that we pray at the start of the day, God, help me to see my world through your eyes. Help me not to be so overwhelmed with work that I don't see the people there. And on a weekly basis, maybe it's once a week I'll go for coffee with someone and have an intentional conversation with them. And what if once a month it's, I will have, you know, maybe without COVID being here, you know, I have someone over, you know. We'll, we'll go out for something. We'll go for a walk, maybe. Um, but it's, again, this intentionalized thing. Uh, what about rest? Well, I'm going to daily work a reasonable amount of time. But I'm going to sleep a reasonable amount of time. And on a weekly basis, I'm going to stop working for a day. And I'm going to actually have that Sabbath. And on a monthly basis, we're going to do something special once a month at least. That's just out of the ordinary. And quarterly or annually, we're going to have vacation or whatever it is. But what if you went through each of those... And you began to say, what is it that would bring me greater life and greater depth if I actually had a plan in this area? And then the, the last column there is just review. It's on a daily basis, I'm just going to look back, and we often call that a reflection at the end of the day. How did I do today? Was I too busy? Did I see God at work? Looking back, did I miss God somewhere that... Did he say something to me that I never followed up on? Did I break one of these rules kind of thing? And then once a week, how do I look back and just review the week? How did I do? And once a month, that's one of the beauties of having communion, I think, once a month. And this Sunday's communion. So maybe this Saturday, just 
Sit down and do a reflection. How have I done in the month of September? How have I lived my life? Is there things I need to confess? Is there things I need to change? And this little chart maybe will help us find some of the positive things. You know, sometimes we look back in confession and we find all the sins we committed, but we don't catch all the things we could have done that were opportunities that were left behind. And this allows us to see kind of some of the positive things that could have happened in this month if I'd been more intentional. And so just this idea of do we have a rule of life? Do we have a plan? Do we have an intentional way of living? And just summing up all these sermons together is this chart. And I just invite you to take one uh, it's on the web. You can just go on there and download it and print it off. It's an uh, electronic version on the web, so if you want to fill it in electronically, it's in an Excel file. Um, we love you to be able just to kind of fill that out, to begin to be intentional about this life. We started by saying, if we're going to grow, it has to come from an inward intention. And this simple tool is, is just a way of doing that. And I invite you to do that. And I invite you to consider, what would happen if you did? What if you were this apple tree and your roots go deep down and your trunk is this resilience to the storms of life, but it's also taking the uh, goodness out of the root and it's bearing fruit on the branches? And what if we were an apple tree that was just covered with apples? What if we could make a difference in this world? And someone came to an orchidist one time, an orchidist, and uh, said to them, wonder how many apples you get off of the average tree. And the orchidist says, well, you know, I just happen to know that. And he told him the number. But he said, you know, that's not the most important thing in some ways. He says, the more important thing is how many trees are in an apple. He said, you take those seeds and you plant them and they bear trees and they bear fruit, then you take all those apples and you take the seeds from them and you plant them, and in a generation or two, the difference is amazing. And I think in our lives, if we can become these fruit-bearing, reproducing Christians, what a change we could make in this world as God just begins to use us to make a difference. But it's only going to happen as we're able to root ourselves firmly in the soil. It's only going to happen as we come and just allow God to be at work, but also build an intentional plan for how that's going to happen. And so I invite you to take that sheet and to use it. I invite you to take these sermons and to put them into practice. Because I believe they're the most practical things you will hear this month. And I believe that if we could put this into practice, our lives would be so different and the world around us would be different because we'd be those fully devoted followers of Jesus bearing fruit, making a difference in our world. So, Father, we come and we bow and we thank you for being able to celebrate communion today, to be able to be reminded that you have forgiven us for our sin, that you have died in our place, you have given us your Holy Spirit, and we are now your children. And Father, that is so incredible. But more than that, Father, you have called us to be your co-workers, those who make a difference in this world. And Father, we just want to be those who are firmly rooted in you, who are bearing fruit that makes a difference in this world. So, Father God, we pray, help us to be those apple trees that bear fruit, that make a difference. Help us to be those who are part of your kingdom, part of those who don't just pray, may your kingdom come and may your will be done, but we pray, may your will be done in our lives. Use us, we pray, to make a difference in your world, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.